Hello and welcome to News Click for the second part of our discussion of the larger strategic issues regarding West Asia and North Africa. We have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we'll continue our discussions with Syria. Syria has been of much larger strategic significance than just one country. It also has strategic influence on Lebanon. It also has a border with Israel and of course the Palestinian influence is there. In a larger sense, the, can you explain to at least our audience, what is the strategic role of Syria in West Asia and why is its uh, current political scenario so important? Well, uh, for one thing, Syria is the last remaining representative of Arab nationalism as it used to be understood historically. Uh, it still calls itself socialist, even though it has implemented a great deal of this neoliberal reform. Uh, state sector sector is still dominant. Uh, it does it bans, literally bans, um, religion from politics. Um, not not just separates. It will not recognize the existence of a religious political party in the political spectrum. Uh, it is the historic opponent of Israel for a variety of reasons. And one of them is that in the historic imagination of Syria, Palestine is a part of Syria. Part of the larger Shams. Shams. The, in the, during the Ottoman days, um, <coughs> the, the region of Sham was Syria, Lebanon, part of Jordan, and Palestine. Uh, it is, Syria is, a, is, is completely reconciled to Palest the separation of Palestine, but there's that historic bond. So that the result has been that the Palestinians, refugees even, have been treated in Syria very differently and much more uh, fraternally than in, a, in any other Arab country very much as if, you know, they're first cousins. Of course, such a large population making claims on national resources as of Syria, there is some resentment also, but by and large, they have absorbed uh, Palestinians much better than any other Arab country has. Uh, they have uh, an absolutely adamant claim on a, a preeminent role uh, as a foreign power, but a preeminent role in Lebanon. Uh, this, they find, is absolutely important for their security. That's one uh, part, the historic representative of Arab nationalism. Uh, their claims, and that's how they are perceived. Part of their territory is occupied by Israel, the Jolan, uh, and uh, annexed, actually, by the Israelis. Uh, so there is, a, there is that territorial dispute. In fact, there is a part of southern Lebanon where, again, there is a Syrian claim, Lebanese claim, and Israeli occupation of it. One of the reasons for this uh, uh, relationship with, a very close relationship with Hezbollah is that Hezbollah fought against Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon push them out, is still is fighting and will and hopes to push them out of that remaining region, which is claimed by both Syria and Lebanon. Uh, <clears throat> so, so there is that. Which brings me to the other uh, fa factor that Syria has a very close relationship both with Hezbollah in uh, uh, Lebanon and with Hamas. Uh, as you know, Damascus is the uh, place where Khalid Michel lives. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then on regional strategic level, the only country with which Syria is otherwise aligned very closely is Iran. It's not Syria's choice. 
by any means. It is simply that that is the only country left with which Syrian strategic interests actually coincide. Um, so if you remove Syria, then the cordon sanitaire around Israel is complete. There is no adversary left. There is then Iran, not sharing a border, not a part of the historic Arab world. Iran gets isolated. And their perception is that both Hezbollah and Hamas will lose enormously. But there is then this cordon uh, sanitaire around them. So Syria has that kind of a strategic uh, situation there. In the old days, it was a very close, it was very closely aligned with the socialist bloc. Um, and some of that kind of alignment still remains. But that is a larger part of the strategic opposition to Israel and therefore also confrontation with American imperialism. There one can argue that for Arab nationalism to align with the socialist bloc earlier was really a part of the same process that you talked about today. Not so much out of choice alone, but also by uh, out of the fact that there is only uh, one which it could align strategically given the kind of... Well, I, 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 had, I had in mind imperialism, Zionism, but also Arab reaction. That the historic battle that has been fought in the Arab world since the late 1940s between secular democrat, <coughs> well, not terribly democratic, but secular Arab nationalism, secular republican, anti-Zionist, anti-monarchical nationalism. Um, uh, and, and in its social economic policy is quite progressive. I mean, it, it destroyed, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, feudal remnants in Egypt, for example. So it is, Syria is the last remaining representative of that. So the Saudi, uh, for example, Saudis and the Qataris and all of these people, the monarchical Gulf Council and all of these people, their hatred of of Syria is comes from that old base and then gets connected with Syria's more recent alignment with Iran. This is a very recent alignment. It's not a historic alignment. So, so th there is that. It's an interesting issue that you're raising because if you really look at it, the first American alignment in this region against Arab nationalism was with Muslim Brotherhood both in Egypt and in uh, Syria. And of course, also with the Saudis for almost similar reasons. It was really an opposition to Arab nationalism that they were uh, they were uh, they were really fighting. The Truman Doctrine says so. Since the days of the Truman Doctrine, Islam has been looked at as the great bulwark against all of these insurgent forces in this part of the world. Um, the uh, the then one of the prominent leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and a whole gang of them were welcomed in the White House by Eisenhower. It goes back that far, this alignment with the Muslim Brotherhood. Famous, and finally their famous photograph with Eisenhower. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And it is that same process that brought the jihadis to Afghanistan. Islam will, will fight against Arab nationalism, against communism, this, that, and the other. So, so it's a whole configuration. And having, defeat, you know, having defeated them in one place after another after another, Syria is perceived as that. Um, so there is a Syria Accountability Act passed by the U.S. Congress since then, the undermining of the Syrian government with the view to regime change has been an objective of successive U.S. administrations. So if you look at it, for them, Arab Spring or the democratic stirrings in the Arab world was in that sense also an opportunity for regime change which they are interested in in any case. Of course, that does not say that the Basid al-Assad regime is particularly democratic. It is not. But given this fact that there was this 
uh, already a configuration of forces looking for regime change. Would you say that this was considered as an opportunity to therefore effect what they always wanted? The way I see it, the Arab Spring uh, becoming this occasion, the Mubarak regime was being perceived uh, as tottering. He was 82 years old. The, uh, Something had to be done about that regime. So I don't think the U.S. was that keen to protect that regime. Second uh, is that, yes, there were disgruntled elements in Libya, in Syria, for a variety of reasons. Um, but in Syria, certainly, they were very small. The Muslim Brotherhood has a, historically had a very small base. Um, they were very powerful in the 60s, quite powerful in the 60s and the early 70s. When Hafiz al-Assad regime came in, uh, since then uh, they were on the defensive. Then they tried to take the initiative after the Iranian revolution and the uh, Israeli occupation of Lebanon when Syria was, the Syrian regime was not quite sure, you know, was sort of on the defensive. Uh, but 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 they had hit back. The the, the regime uh, contained them very well. So, what you had in Syria was Muslim Brotherhood inside the country, and a whole lot of exiled intellectuals in Paris and uh, mainly in Paris, and, you know, uh, elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> there were all kinds of dissatisfaction and so on. Uh, Americans have known from the beginning, the West has known from the beginning, that their only chance in Syria would be if they could have, they could establish a so-called liberated zone, preferably on the, on, on the borders of Turkey, uh, which could become a kind of a Benghazi, and where you could supply and which, which could become the uh, ground. Uh, um, for intervention. They have known that there would not be a popular uprising of the kind that, uh, uh, I mean, they have given all kinds of disinformation, but uh, that there would never be a popular uprising of the sort, let's say, even that you had in, in Egypt. Um, in, in Syria, there are too many forces afraid of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, Syria is a genuinely secular country for by and large. 25% of the population consists of various kinds of minorities. The fact that the Assad regime absolutely insists on very hard variant of secularism gives that 25% great sense of security with the state and all that. So there, was no, there, were, there were no grounds uh, that they could use. So this is very much manufactured very much manufactured from the beginning. And killings have been going on, killings of the state personnel have been going on from the beginning. Over a thousand members of the state personnel have been killed so far. It's almost 30% of the total number of casualties that have taken place Absolutely. in yes. Syria. Yes, yes, but you will never know it from the, uh, the established media. Uh, that has been going on from the beginning. And the violence has been there from the beginning because the kind of popular uprising you saw in Tunisia or, uh, or Egypt. Or Yemen. Or Yemen, for, for example. That, 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 or or Bahrain. Um, uh, th there were no grounds for that sort of thing uh, in Syria. You could not bring hundreds of thousands of people in, in the streets. And that's not because the Assad regime is more uh, authoritarian than all those other regimes. It's or not less authoritarian than the... Or, uh, no, what I meant was that it's more authoritarian and therefore people can't come out. Not true. Okay. Uh, that's not the reason why you couldn't have huge big demonstrations of various sorts. A disinformation in the case of Syria is actually, in my view, even greater than there was uh, in the case of Libya. But there is one issue within Syria itself which needs some discussion, which is that the Bashar al-Assad regime at one point did promise a certain kind of democratic reforms. This set of events that have been orchestrated seems to have also squeezed the middle ground 
and it does look as if those reforms will remain only on paper. And in that sense, a relaxation of the kind of repressive regime, if you will, is not likely to be on the agenda soon. And this is one of the unexpected consequences of what's happening. There are a number of things that are going on, and this question of the offering of the um, uh, of the um, reforms, very extensive reforms, by the way, very extensive reforms. The only thing on which they dug in their heels was the issue of Muslim Brotherhood, and that is the issue I am told on which the negotiations with Turkey broke down. Turkey wanted 50-60% of the transitional um, you know, umbrella organization, 50% of the seats to be allotted to the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, the Syrian regime said, constitutionally, we cannot give a seat to a religious party, uh, etc. So reforms were rejected out of hand because the objective is regime change. Do you think the Bashar al-Assad regime can ride it out? Because at the, at the moment it seems that he has tidied over the initial crisis which was there and he seems to be very much in control except one or two spots like Homs and a couple of other places. Do you think that this particular phase is actually mm -hmm. over? The control of the regime is, is not in question. Um, what the regime has been able to do is to deny them that creation of that sanctuary where these people could be, you know, could all be brought together. The creation of a Benghazi. That they have been able to. Uh, the amount of weaponry and the quality of weaponry that has come into, uh, into Syria in the hands of the, the you know, anti-state uh, elements, these, what the Syrians are calling the armed gangs, is extraordinary. Um, extremely sophisticated weaponry has come, come in. It has come from Israel, it has come from Turkey, it has come f through Lebanon, paid for by Saudi Arabia and so on. So it is quite an achievement on the part of the, uh, of the regime so far to have denied them a place where the army could not uh, penetrate. This, this much they have been able to do so far. How long this will last, we don't know. The other difference is that the international, at least community, at least the BRICS, China, uh, has also denied the kind of sanction that United States and NATO got in uh, Libya? Yes, uh, so far. And in fact, uh, I'm told that uh, the, uh, some of the uh, helicopters of the Assad regime have been uh, uh, flying uh, Russian and Chinese flags in appreciation of it to be photographed. Uh, so far, yes. But we have seen the uh, Russians and the Chinese knuckle under from Iraq to Libya. How long this will go on, we don't know. It's perfectly possible if the Americans decide it, if the French decide it, if the Turks want it, for them to go to the Security Council, let Russia and China veto, that the rest of them say, international community in the proper sense, which is the West, says this mechanism has bro broken down. NATO has to move in on its own. Uh, in the case of uh, Libya, they did not get a resolution for uh, military intervention. They converted it to... Uh, completely. To I mean, it, it, had, it had no resemblance to the resolution that was there. And after they had captured Tripoli, they were bombing Sirta to just to capture uh, Qaddafi. It had no resemblance to the resolution that they had got. So now they can say we didn't get a resolution. Uh, remember, uh, they went into Iraq without a resolution. 
So not getting a resolution of the Security Council is not going to stop them if they make the decision. Will they make the decision? That's a question. Now, the Syrian army has been able to do that. But Syrian army has a very low level of weaponry. They're really fighting with the 1980s level of weaponry. So a real invasion they cannot fight against. That's clear. That was that, yeah. That's never really in question. Yeah. The kind of firepower yeah. NATO brings yeah. to yeah. an operation. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, they don't even have uh, modern missiles of that sort. They don't even have the weaponry that Iran has, for example. Uh, Iran, uh, the kind of weaponry that the, uh, uh, that the Russians have given them, uh, especially missiles, uh, it's, a, it's of a completely different league. The question is, are the Americans going to decide that? The creation of this National Council in Ankara uh, is a very alarming development. Um, and the Ankara gang that they have collected is willing to give the Muslim Brotherhood a very prominent role. Um, uh, Burhan Ghalayoun uh, is the man who has been lobbying uh, both EU and the United States for a long time. Uh, he has no base. He's a professor, at, uh, quite a decent professor um, in his subject uh, <clears throat> in, in Paris, but he has no political base. Um, he has emerged as the leader. They can always make him president. They made Karzai president. So we have to see which way the events yeah. will go. But at, the, at, at the moment, it does seem that the Basad regime is holding. So even yeah, if it's, it's they cannot holding. face it's a holding. It's holding. Yeah. invasion. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ezaz. We'll continue to watch the developments as it happens in News Click. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you.